you. Um, a lot of the people in campaign delivery, especially like the higher ups like John Pace, have decided rather than to go the route you're going, uh, to go for the takeover of the Republican Party through people like Ron Paul and Gary Johnson. Uh, what would be your criticisms of that and why would you choose the route you go? Um, there's, a, there's another analogy, but there's this analogy that just really comes to mind. Uh, a while ago, uh, McDonald's came under a lot of attack because their food was unhealthy. So they finally bowed to the pressure and they're like, look, we're going to put salads on the menu. Is everybody happy now? And for a while, everybody was happy until people realized that if you put the dressing on the salad, it actually became the most unhealthy thing on the entire menu. <laughs> and I think that, in a lot of ways, the Republican and Democrat parties are, oh, sorry, the Republican and Democratic parties are the, are similar to that. And that these are groups that time and time again have done the bare minimum to keep liberty-minded people happy. I think what we need to see is like a real transformation. It reminds me, to take another food analogy, it reminds me of the organic food kind of revolution that you're, that you're seeing in, in, in a lot of cities now. I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the people, it only very few people ever heard of Whole Foods or ever even think about shopping. And now it's growing in leaps and bounds. Uh, by the way, interestingly enough, the, the Whole Foods CEO himself is actually very outspoken libertarian. Um, I think it's going to require that kind of just extreme dedication. I mean, you look at like what happens in places like Whole Foods and, and other small you know restaurants that are really dedicated to the idea of high quality food, and you compare it to the sort of you know hand waving attempts at more or less appeasing health conscious people that you see in fast food companies, and there's it's like the difference between the earth and the sky. There is there couldn't be a bigger difference. So to me, what I think, at least for me, and what I think we should really be focusing on as liberty minded individuals is creating something that is driven by liberty, not just willing to sort of accede to some of the libertarian demands. So your second part of the question was why did you take why, why did I why did I take that I, I mean that's basically why I took that path. I mean I want to see this party, this organization grow. I want you know I think that that uh, in a lot of ways we're dealing with a situation like we had earlier in American history. We had these uh, these guys like John Locke that came up with these awesome ideas and then nothing really happened. And then a generation later, a couple of generations later, you had these writers like Thomas Paine and Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson that knew how to take those ideas, not really changing the ideas, not coming up with new ideas, but presenting them in a way that people could connect to and relate to and leading to the actual first libertarian revolution. Given your background in ideology, I'm curious what you think about the recent machine scam work out. In which one? The uh, testing machine. Uh, you know, I, I, I keep so much track of what, ha what happened in D.C., but there's these cheating scandals happening in, in, in D.C. Embarrassingly enough, my alma mater, the, the Atlantic School, was actually involved in one of them a few years ago. Um, you know, when you see, when you're a kid, and this, and this you know, I, this, this might not resonate with something that's, that, that, you know, I'll have to live with that. When you're a kid, what you do is you look up to adults. That's what you do, to a certain extent, and you use them as a model for, for what's right and what's wrong. Now, as big as any individual cheating scandals are, and there are plenty of them, there's, there's some that are going on in Montgomery County right now, they're nothing compared to the kind of cheating scandals we saw with the Wall Street bailout. And these are kids that are really saying, look at these guys, these are, these are supposed to be the leaders of the country, look at what they're doing. When you have those that are role models, when you have cheaters as our role models, and that are not at all being punished, that are essentially being rewarded for their dishonesty, their dishonesty and incompetence, it doesn't really surprise me to see that behavior among students. It's something as an educator I try to fight against, and you know, try to encourage people to not do, obviously. But you know, I, I, I really feel like the type of role models that we're giving people, or that the type of multiple people that we're allowing to continue to exist as role models, rather than you know, behind bars, or at least certainly out of business, I think is, is one of the driving forces behind that. So hopefully that um, I mean, the easier side is always different. Democrats are a thousand times easier because in anything emotional, they already agree with us. I mean, in terms of you know, things that are related to free speech, they already agree with us. You know, all those things that aren't really facts, um, that are, or at least are often not seen as facts, are seen as emotion, they already agree with us. And emotion is a hard thing to change. So with Democrats, it's, you know, I like to bring up the example of rubber rooms. Um, I like to bring up examples of, of, of monetary policy. I mean, monetary policy at first seems a little bit dry. When you say, you know, what is your interest rate? You know, your interest rate, your savings rate is basically zero. But it, at, at, and during an open, and during an open economy, it's essentially 10%, you know, where did that, where did the rest of it go? Where is it? You know, what happened to it? Where is it going? I mean, the, the money that you see going into the financial sector is coming from somewhere. So I mean, sometimes it's, it's, you know, things like that, but really for Democrats, what I found works the best, what really opens their eyes and gets them to start looking on their own is 
the education. When you really look at education policy, uh, a really easy way to illustrate that is this. We know that high school education in 12th grade is struggling nationally, internationally. But one year later, at the college level, American education is the best in the world. So what in the world is going on between in that one year in increment? I mean, I think it's pretty clear that at one level, it's being the, the sectors dominated by the government bureaucracies, and one step later, it being dominated by the private sector. And of course, there are state schools, but they have to compete with the private sector schools just as any other private sector school would. So I know that those, those are illustrations. Like when, when it comes to talking to Republicans, sometimes I'll talk about the one thing that actually makes them uncomfortable, which is marijuana policy. And they'll say, you know what, I don't like pot smokers. I'm like, well, how much do you not like pot smokers? I mean, do you dislike them $60,000 worth? Because that's how much it costs to keep these nonviolent people in jail. Do you, I mean, if they give them, do you like, do you dislike them $120,000? I mean, how much? And is really your personal dislike of somebody a reason to lock them up? And then if you show them a video of a SWAT team raid, which is, you know, you know with their, you've seen them sort of circling around Facebook, or if you can show them how, how a lot of the uh, beliefs that their party put forward, like for example the idea that, that Reagan cut down government, unless you actually look at the dollar numbers, in which case you should really actually do that. You know, when you start to make them question some of these very deeply held assumptions, it makes them really, really, really start to rethink some of that. Um, the education thing, of course, works well with, well with Republicans as well, because a lot of Republicans are, have already come on board with that kind of libertarian philosophy, which, which as far as I know, the idea of voucher was first put forward by Milton Friedman, um, unless somebody else had, had the idea before. <laughs> oh, I have another. Well, what about the thing that Hillary Clinton said, which was, you know, the rich don't pay enough in taxes, they don't pay their fair, their fair share. And honestly, like a lot of people right now probably feel that way because they're out of a job, they're out of their homes, whatever, or they're in their homes but not paying. Um, you know, like what do you have to say about that? There's um, I, I, I know I don't know if some of you guys have seen the show The West Wing. It's, it's you know one of my favorite shows. I think it's a, it's a really well done show, even though it comes very much from a from a social liberal kind of fiscal liberal uh, standpoint. It, it, it I think it's a good show. There's one scene where one of the people says that, you know, you say that we don't pay our fair share of tax. This is, a, this is in the show, is a Democratic kind of character. And he says, you know, when I was working at this law firm, I paid 27 times the average amount of income tax. So I was paying my fair share and 26 other people's fair share, too. He's like, but then they said, you know, but the fire department doesn't come to my house 25 times, 27 times faster. You know, I don't get 27 votes from election day, et cetera, et cetera. And then he basically said, you know, I'm not, he's like, I didn't have a problem doing it because that's the only way it's going to work. But you know when you're when you're saying that you should you should be thankful. I mean, the people who are picking up this burden are picking up the burden. I mean, that's that's something that we need to consider. So when you see that the rich aren't paying their fair share, I think what people are basically saying is that the rich could pay more, and sure they probably could. I mean, the, the ultra rich could probably, if you took all their money and threw them on the street, they, they might not die. They could get you know welfare and unemployment. But it doesn't make it right, and it doesn't make it fair. And I think that if you want to encourage people to do to, to produce the best. You need to have that thing, but if, to take it beyond that simple idea, if somebody earns something, it's theirs, and if you're going to take it by force, you better have a really good reason to take it. And you better be treating that dollar, every single dollar of that, as if it's the most sacred thing on earth, because it is. There is nothing more sacred than money that somebody else has given you, except for the money that you have taken. And if you're taking it, the burden is on you to use it as well as you can. It's like that old uh, discussion, you know, would you steal bread to feed a starving child? I don't know, maybe, probably I would. Would you steal bread just for the hell of it? You know, I don't think that anybody in this room would even think of that as a, as even an option. So, so when we're, when we're talking about the rich not paying their fair share, I mean, the rich are paying more than their fair share, and they're, they're paying more taxes. That's, you know, the simple fact. 